you shouldn't have to drive to live. I know this is a crazy idea, but as a freedom-loving, red-blooded American who is just absolutely enthralled with the concept of personal liberty, the idea that in so many cities in this country, you are required to have a motor vehicle to have just a bare minimum standard of life is insane because cars are expensive as hell, brother. People already don't have a lot of money and have to pay for all this other kind of like food, stuff for their kids, medical bills, any loans from going to school. People don't hardly have money. So to force them to get a car or else they have to walk uphill both ways in the snow seven miles just to get to work, that's not great. That's not freedom. Because as an American, you should have the freedom to go from point A to point B, from your home to your place of work, from your place of work to home, from your home to your child's school, from your child's school to home. You should be able to do that in whatever means of travel you want. You should have the freedom to do that. But currently in America, you do not in a lot of places. What in the hell is this? From the authoritative source, of course, Dexerto. Not to be confused with the better and actual authoritative source, Dexertonox. Idaho opened its first in and out and the drive through wait was eight hours. I don't need all that music shit. So this, my friends, is what we call mental illness. You see it right here. There are many examples of it online, but this is a very clear-cut case of mental illness. You could probably find this in a variety of other places, but this one right here is mental illness. <laughs> I feel like that if you green screen what I'm looking at and put dank memes on it, it could be very funny. But yeah, it, it, this is literally a consequence of like the mass psychosis that Americans are in. And even Canadians, like just North American infrastructural planning generally, city planning generally, like a mass psychosis of hyper individualism meets automobile industry lobbying and capitalism run amok meets bad fast food. Okay? And I can explain. So, for one, drive throughs generally are stupid. You go to a food establishment. I assume, you know, I, I understand people want to get it quickly and get out. That's kind of the point. That's what people used to do takeout, takeaway for where you exit the whatever you use to get there, or just keep walking if you walked there, if you could, got your food, paid for it, left, right? Because you want to eat it elsewhere, take it home, eat it there, whatever. So then drive throughs were invented after, you know, the automobile became a common thing American consumers had, and they were like, okay, well, we can make this more efficient. The thing is, the unfortunate consequence of this is that a lot of fast food chains end up actually making more money through the drive-thru because of the idea that people want to just be able to quickly grab a thing and go. And that by itself is not a problem, right? If the faster means of selling a food, getting it to the consumer is, you know, making money, that's fine. The problem here is that we're using automobiles to do it. And this is also bad for the consumer. Because sure, you might be getting your food faster, but you're also spending more money on gas. Because while you're sitting in line, and you know, not every drive through line is eight hours, but if you've seen a Chick-fil-A in a busy area, people wait in line for a long time, even though they have two, count them, two drive through lanes. People will wait so long in their car for their food, in their little climate-controlled motor vehicle, their little cubicle on wheels. And that entire time, unless you're literally turning your car off and starting it again each time you are at a stop and braking, you're getting zero miles to the gallon, man. You are burning fuel for free. It is a waste of money to sit there in a line. And often it is the case that the fast food is overpriced. Now, this isn't always the case. You know, you got a Little Caesars hot and ready for five bucks. You get what you pay for. It's not incredible, but it's good for five bucks and it's hot and ready. You know, I've got a couple other people, uh, namely, you know, some MILFs out there that I'm aware of that you might also be aware of. Uh, your mother, who's also hot. This is not a good joke. Regardless, that's one. drive throughs are pretty shit. Number two, there's shit on the workers. The reason being, because aside from the person working the window, and the person taking the order over the intercom, the workers are never seen, and only one of them is heard. So because the customer is not directly looking at another human being, they just become a disembodied voice until they get to the, you know, the register to pay, and they see a person, and they get handed their food. Some places like that, I think it was that Taco Bell or something, was trying to actually experiment with completely contactless thing where you would get it like through a chute. Like when you would go to a bank, you'd go to the drive-thru and they'd suck up whatever thing you put in a capsule through a tube. 
that's kind of outdated by this point as well. It's like that. They're trying to get rid of that. So like even then you only hear a person and then at a certain point, they're not even going to hear people. It'll just be something you put in on your app and you never have to think about the human beings who are crafting your meal and then handing it to you. Much less the people who work to do all the other shit involved in running that establishment, like the actual prep of the ingredients, like keeping stock of things, like the people who clean everything, do the dishes, all this kind of stuff. But it depersonalizes the workers to the consumer to the point where people who are going through the drive through start caring less about the people who are working there. And they end up becoming more comfortable with treating the customer service workers like shit. Now, of course, they don't need that level of depersonalization or dehumanization to be pieces of shit to service workers because they already are, you know, plentiful cases of people being pieces of shit in person, seeing another person face to face. But it gives enough pause to people with enough ability to understand that maybe I shouldn't be a complete dickhead to this person I'm looking at, you know? Maybe that's not a cool thing. Maybe, you know, accidents happen. And every single time I come to this establishment, my order is correct. But the one out of 300 times I've come here this week, I actually had a mistake in my order. That's a remarkable success rate. You should be happy about that. But I'm mad because I need everything to go my way. I need to have it my way or I'm going to throw a fit because I am unwell and incapable of controlling my emotions and empathizing with another human being or even group of human beings. So that's really bad. And I know of this because of the fact that I worked in a drive through for several years of my life. I'm intimately aware of just how shit drive through workers get it. The people in the front in the actual like indoor eating area of an establishment of a food place will be often treated better than the people in the drive through. And you couple that with the fact that, you know, people wanting a quick bite to eat and a lot of people being lazy and wanting to go through the drive through because of that, not even necessarily people in a rush. And that making it so that a lot of establishments make more money through the drive through than people coming in to eat, you end up getting people forced into really terrible working conditions, often that the establishment itself is not prepared for. And you have to meet so many quotas for timers to the point where people will like, will close out orders on the POS, which is the computer that, you know, handles all the transactions and shit. We'll close out orders early and actually ask people to put like if you've ever been in a drive through and you've been asked to pull around to the front and somebody would run your order out to you. That's because you getting off of the pad at the window means that the timer stops and that looks good to corporate. That looks good to the higher ups, because if that doesn't happen, then your managers get yelled at by the higher ups, you know, for your workers not being efficient enough cogs in the machine, not efficient enough cattle and getting food out to people in unreasonably fast expectations for time, much less, you know, accuracy to the order. People will be pulled forward and there are so many ways that workers try to game the system to try to get corporate off their backs and, you know, make it look like the absurd expectations for efficiency are being met much less, you know, food safety and accuracy. So that's two. Three, you shouldn't have to drive to live. I know this is a crazy idea, but as a freedom-loving, red-blooded American who is just absolutely enthralled with the concept of personal liberty, individual liberty, the idea that in so many cities in this country, the richest country the face of the earth has ever seen, you are required to have a motor vehicle to have just a bare minimum standard of life is insane. Because cars are expensive as hell, brother. They are so expensive. Average cost to own a car USA. The average cost of owning a car is 10728 per year or $894 per month. Your driving cost report, considerable increase from 11% 2021. So I imagine that's like maintenance and putting gas in your car. $894 a month, not even to mention like potentially your monthly payments if you took out a loan to get the car or your lease payment or just buying the car outright. I doubt that's, you know, factored into it, though it could be. From Nerd Wallet. The average monthly cost of owning a car has surpassed $1,000. From November 30th, 2023, the average cost of owning a car is 77% of minimum wage from Fuck Cars subreddit, which is the authoritarian place to go for this. So that's cool. This is from Source AAA. It's way too goddamn much money. And people don't already have a lot of money. Like, rent is too high because affordable housing isn't being built in large enough quantity. A lot of landlords and property owners are just sitting on empty lots because they want the value of them to go up so they can sell them for more money later. We just have a lot of vacant homes and a lot of people who need homes, and we're not building enough affordable government housing to make up the deficit of the private market. 
so like people already don't have a lot of money and have to pay for all this other kind of shit like food you know stuff for their dependents like their kids medical bills any loans from going to school all this kind of shit people don't hardly have money so to force them to get a car or else they have to walk uphill both ways in the snow seven miles just to get to work that's not great that's not freedom because as an American, you should have the freedom to go from point A to point B, from your home to your place of work, from your place of work to home, from your home to your child's school, from your child's school to home. You should be able to do that in whatever means of travel you want. You should have the freedom to do that. But currently in America, you do not in a lot of places. Now, to give people that freedom, you have a variety of options. One, sure, personal automobiles. If people want to have one, that should be allowed. However, it should be easier and more affordable for people to take a bus, take a train, take light rail, to, you know, potentially even bike or walk. It should be easy, safe, affordable, and well-maintained to have all of those options. And there are very many countries that have been able to do this. You could look at Madrid in Spain. You could look at in the Netherlands as well where they have very robust biking infrastructure and culture to the point where even driving a personal automobile is better there in one of the best countries for walkability, bikeability, public transit. To drive a personal automobile is actually better there than it is in the States, which heavily emphasizes car infrastructure because there are one, less people on the road because there are less people in cars because they don't need them. And for two, the infrastructure is maintained better because there aren't as many cars on the road, meaning that the roads don't get fucked up as much. If you wonder why your highways, your streets, your roads are all, you know, full of potholes, one, it's because of a lack of investment in public infrastructure and mismanagement from, you know, your governors and et cetera, et cetera. But it's also because cars are heavy. And if they, you know, drive over the same asphalt over and over, eventually they crack because of a variety of things, including weather conditions and whatnot. And that just keeps getting worse and worse over time. So states will have to put in money into fixing that often. And they don't often want to do that, so the problems just get worse. And it becomes even worse to drive. And then it becomes worse for your car's quality because your suspension will get fucked if you have to go around or go over so many potholes. It makes traffic accidents more likely to happen because the roads aren't as safe to drive on. So it's, it's worse for literally everybody. And roads don't make the state money. You can try to through tolls or whatever, but everybody hates tolls. Everybody hates toll roads. And often it's the case that tolls aren't actually, you know, owned by the state. They're owned by a corporation that works with the state, but skims money off the top as a middleman from the toll revenues. So even then, that's not good enough. Roads don't pay for themselves. They don't do enough to stimulate the economy to pay for themselves. And it's not to say that they have to because it's a public utility. Public utilities don't have to make money, but they cost way more money than they are worth in many cases, especially when the alternatives are so much less expensive like robust biking infrastructure, walkability, and then for longer term transit, buses, light rail, and trains. And if you hate really crowded planes and really crowded airports, if we made it so that people could take a train from Dallas, Texas to New York in however long that might take, several hours through, you know, super high speed bullet train usage, even if it was like an overnight trip, there would be less people taking planes to get around the continental United States. It wouldn't, you know, stop at all because like if you're going from LA to New York, like being on a train is probably going to be the fastest way or being on a plane rather. Um, but for trips that planes are still being used for, but don't necessarily have to be like it could be a longer train ride, but not as long as Amtrak currently is because our train infrastructure is woefully underfunded and underutilized. It would make using air travel, if that's your preference, better for you as a person using it, much the same way that it would make it better for people who still want to drive a personal automobile. It's literally worse for everybody to hyper-focus on cars, and it's better for everybody to not, to allow for a variety of other freedom of option for movement, because freedom of travel is one of our inalienable rights as Americans. At least, it should be. That's what we've been led to believe it is, because you can go in between state lines just for, you know, being in America. And obviously, this eight hour long drive through is mostly because it's the first in and out. The hype around the drive through line being so long might also draw more lunatics out to the in and out, which is absurd. But like, that's insane. But I'm sure some people are doing that. I'm sure the line inside was dreadful as well. I don't know why you would care to go to an in and out the first time it's been opened. It's going to stale be there later. 
It's just an In-N-Out, man. It's a corporate fast food chain. It's not like Jesus has risen, and the only time you could see him was on this plot of land. It's an In-N-Out, man. For some people, that is their Jesus, but it's very dumb. So it's mental illness. This mass psychosis, this delusion that the American population has been propagandized into, that it is free for everybody to have an automobile. It's not. It's free to allow everybody the option to have an automobile, but it's not free to force people to do it because otherwise they have no other viable options for transit, for moving around. Real freedom is allowing people the freedom to choose if they want to drive a car, if they want to bike, if it's within, you know, a fair distance for that, and the infrastructure is good and safe enough to do it, or to walk, you know, given those conditions, or to take the bus, or to take a train. If you are really mad about the fact that your bus has really long delays all the time, that's partially because they have to work around the fact that the streets are flooded with cars. You can fit like what? I don't even know how many. How many people does the average bus fit? The average bus carries 30 to 100 passengers. Some buses have a capacity up to 300 passengers. So for like regular transit, like within a city, it's not going to be like 100. Uh, I don't think. It's going to be like in the 30 to 60 range for passengers. And that's like, if it's one person per car, that's like, we'll say it's 30. That's 30 cars off the road. So 29 vehicles off the road with the one bus. If it's like two people per car, that's 15 off the road. And that's going to reduce the amount of automobile traffic. Because when you're sitting in traffic, you're not sitting in traffic in your car. You are the traffic. That's you. You can't be like, oh my God, traffic is so bad today while you are the traffic. It's like saying, holy shit. People today stink so bad when you haven't showered for a week because you've been too busy playing Overwatch 2 <laughs> or whatever, or Genshin Impact. Like, you're part of the problem, man. So, like, all other modes of transit get better when people use cars less, so long as they are well-funded, well-maintained, safe, and reliable, which they can be. We see other countries do this. Japan does this well. The Netherlands does this well. Spain does this well. Many European countries do this well. Even New York City does this fairly well. For all its faults, the New York City subway system is actually an engineering marvel in comparison to North America broadly. And I think even the world. It's like up there is like one of the greatest engineering achievements. DC has a metro system on par with Europe. Yeah. So like there are examples of it working in the States. Like obviously the New York system is not as great because there's a lot of problems with it, mostly because the governance in New York is dog shit. And there's still a whole lot of fucking emphasis on car infrastructure there. But like, there, there's a way to fix this problem. So in, in the world that I'm thinking of, where, you know, you have this ideal of freedom when it comes to people choosing to get around, you would still have long waits at popular restaurants, even fast food places. But the thing is, if you're out, like if you took a bus to go to the In-N-Out, but there was a long wait, well, if there's other stores or things to do, like a public park within walking distance of that in and out I'm sure like stores could have a way of like saving a spot and like getting a call however long before your expected ability to order food. Maybe not an in and out but like other establishments, you'll be able to make a reservation. Obviously not like fast food places. That's not usually what's happening. But like you could do that. If you do have a reservation, you can go out and do other things. You can look at other stores in the area because you could just walk to it. You are not walking anywhere else in this fucking shithole other than like this strip mall maybe, but you have to walk across this absolute football field of asphalt for parking in order to do it. Nobody wants to do all that shit. It looks like shit. It feels like shit. It's trash. Like nobody's gonna, oh no, there's a really long line at the In-N-Out. Let me cross this fucking seven lane strode, this highway masquerading as a, a road or as a street to go to the Ross dress for less and, and kill some time. It's not happening, man. But in the ideal situation, you'd be able to go and look at other shit or just go to a public park, take a seat on a bench somewhere if we didn't hate homeless people in this country and didn't get rid of so many public amenities like public bathrooms, like public water fountains, like public benches, because we don't like homeless people and don't want to see them. Because, you know, homeless people were utilizing those services because it's the only thing they had. Because they don't even have a pot to piss in or a roof over their head. Because we just don't build enough housing for people. Like, these problems are fixable. We just have to have the will to fix them. We have the money. We have the engineering know-how. It's going to be more difficult in the States because we have to undo like, so many bad decisions when it comes to over-focusing on car infrastructure 
but it's possible over a long enough amount of time that we can make this happen. And it's better for the environment if you're a fucking bleeding heart liberal that believes in that climate change mumbo jumbo. It's better for the environment too. I feel like the U.S. is getting there slowly, but we're not emphasizing transit enough in the new plans. Most of where we fail is walkability around stations. A lot of cities are here built light rail, but the stations include many park and rides. You have to make the area around stations human-centered. Yeah, park and rides are a fucking disease on public transit. For those of you who don't know, park and ride literally means you drive to the station, park your car, go to whatever station you're going to, and ideally at that point you could walk around to wherever you need to go, but in worst case scenario you need to get another car somehow to be able to go to the next stop. It's really stupid. Uh, usually it's that the stop that you get to, the station you get to from after you've parked to ride, you don't need a car to get where you need to be. You shouldn't have to drive to that station to begin with. And some bullshit like even Seattle, which in terms of the broader United States of America has a pretty good public transit system and like bikeability and walkability, despite the challenge of it being very hilly, is still lacking in so many areas that could be improved. Like, you know, housing availability and affordable housing, like biking infrastructure and walking infrastructure, like better bus and light rail infrastructure. And it's being worked on. There's light rail being built connecting, I think, Seattle proper to Bellevue across the Sound, which is a big plot of water around the Isthmus that is the land formation of Seattle, Washington. It could be so much better. Those scooters in Seattle just ain't it. Well, the funny thing about those scooters is that for all their faults, and there are many, I fucking hate them. It's just another leech, like, parasite enterprise, kind of like Uber and Lyft, of, like, there being a problem in the infrastructure and there being a problem in the broader economy to the point where people don't want to buy their own electric scooter, they want to rent one, or people will take an Uber instead of driving themselves because having a car is expensive, even though taking regular Uber trips is more expensive than taking regular taxi trips even in areas that have good taxi systems. Um, but obviously, that's also going to be more expensive than being able to bike and walk around. Those scooters are specifically there to leech a lot of that money that there is to be made there for people having a want to be able to get around without a car, but not really having it. Because they're electric, they help you move a lot faster and get up hills easier and all this kind of shit. And despite all of those negatives, it has in certain areas actually made municipalities think more about and actually invest more in their biking infrastructure. Because you have so many of these scooters on the road presenting so many problems for car traffic and bus traffic and for it generally not being safe. But because they are becoming more and more popular, municipalities and cities and whatnot are like, oh shit, well, these are being used a lot. Maybe we should make safer avenues for them to travel on like a bike lane like a protected bike lane. And then they actually end up building it because of that. So it's like one way that it's a terrible problem. The blight, the parasite that is that kind of gig economy garbage. But it's not even a gig economy at that point. But it's like in the periphery. And like actually getting a good outcome from it. But like I would obviously rather that not be the reason why. <laughs> to help out a corporation with their uh, scooter rental profits. Because that's obviously going to be the first thing a lot of these cities are going to care about is making that corporation more money so that they, you know, stimulate the economy in the area and blah, 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 blah. I don't even know if you need to be, you know, based in the state that you're in to provide it, though. So I don't know. But it does, you know, help people get around, which can help stimulate the economy in that way for people going out and purchasing goods and services or going to work and allowing for that. So, you know, whatever. Thank you very much, Michael, for the raid. Hope you had a good stream. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm on, I'm on a big tangent. I'm fuck cars since day one. Not a big fan. I lived in an area where I need to drive like 30 minutes both ways to get to work. It was dreadful. There was nowhere to walk to. Shit sucked. So I've lived in the middle of nowhere in dying towns my whole life. I've never been wealthy. Shit is ass. The bus system where I used to live, literal dog shit. You were lucky if it even showed up. Not good. Not very good, folks. Believe me. If I was president, we would have the best, some people would say, the best the world has ever seen, the universe has ever seen, the best public transit you could possibly get if I was president. God damn. Um, but we don't have it. And uh, this is a disease. This is a mental disorder. Over-reliance on cars. It is a problem. And, uh, you know, this is just a fun way to talk about it, I guess, because in and out really isn't that great. It's fine. You don't need to be waiting eight hours for it, though, in fucking Idaho. I didn't even know there were enough people in Idaho to fill up an eight-hour line. That's insane. Fucking hate NJ Transit. Yeah, it's good in, like, a couple cities in New Jersey. And by good, I mean good for U.S. standards. Also, Canada, you know, you can get these hands too, Canada. You're not much better. 
you got the same problems. You have the same sickness that you contracted probably from us for, you know, as liberal as Canada is made out to be because you're compared to the United States of America. You're not much better. You got the same problem because for whatever reason, Canada, America's hat really wants to be America too. I don't know why you would want to do this. You know, people in Canada want to be America too so much so that the fucking people in Alberta really want to secede to the United States for some reason. <laughs> Like, I, I don't get it. It's not good. If you really want to be that example of the shining city on the hill, Canada, you need to get your act together. Stop relying on cars so much. Stop jacking our swag. Canada managed to do Amtrak, but worse. Via rail is such a shit show. Yeah, no, it's terrible. Uh, shouts out all my orange pillars out there. Not just bikes. Alan Fisher, the armchair urbanist, city nerd. All these urbanist YouTube channels you should go look at if you like what I've talked about here. Not Just Bikes is a really good starter point. Alan Fisher is a bit more meme a bit more internet poisoned, which I like. Um, City Nerd is for the people who want to get real into the nitty gritty. So it's not for everybody, but I like him. It's good shit. And they're better than me at well, everything we're talking about. But maybe not in style. Just substance. This is the Boise area. It's a massive sprawl. There's over 500k people. <laughs> 500k people. Lole. Wait, how many... Seattle is actually a surprisingly small city. How many people are in uh, Seattle? 733,919. I'm one of them. Wait, what? Wait, this is population 2021. The Seattle metropolitan area's population is 4.02 million. Eh. Wait, what does that mean? What is the metropolitan area? Am I stupid or dumb? <clears throat> I'm, I'm stupid and dumb. Okay, the metropolitan area is a different thing. Question mark? Seattle. That's true. Sorry, that was really loud. Seattle is a seaport city on the west coast of the United States. It is the seat of King County, Washington. With a 2022 population of 749,256, it is the most populous city in both the state of Washington and the Pacific Northwest region of North America, and the 18th most populous city in the United States. The Seattle metropolitan area's population is 4.02 million, making it the 15th largest in the United States. What's a metropolitan area, you may ask? We don't know. We made it up. This term was invented by a writer. It never happened. Not a chance. Not this time. <laughs> what the fuck is a metropolitan area? An urban conglomeration in the U.S. state of Washington that comprises Seattle and its surrounding satellites and suburbs. Ah, I see. I see, I see, said the blind man to his deaf son. Its growth rate of 21.1% between 2010 and 2020 made it one of the country's fastest growing large cities and it has a big needle that was built for the uh, World's Fair and also one of the sexiest volcanoes in the continental United States, aside from Yellowstone, of course. Mount Rainier. What a sexy bitch. Look at that. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Yeah. Damn! You can see it from the city, too. This is like the most famous image of Seattle. The resolution, however, not great. Well, you can literally see Rainier from the city. See, look, there's the needle. Yeah! One day it's gonna explode and be a problem? Yeah, but I'll be long dead, so that's not my problem. Look at that! <whistles> Rainier looks crazy here. Is it even real? I can tell you that I've seen it in person, so unless the mirage is just that good... I can see it every day of my life if I want, because it's that big. I will say on like another brief tangent, I love having a mountain I can see in the distance with like very minimal investment. It's so cool. And it's very grounding. Like where I used to live is just nothing, like flat land for miles, like some hills, like some trees and whatnot. But like this big, this like super massive, like incomprehensibly big land mass just visible from so many different areas so big to the point where in the horizon when you move it barely moves at all you know how like when you're on the road and the trees by you go pew, 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 pew. and like you're you're pretending there's a skateboarder out there doing tricks like tony hawks underground too yeah the mountain's not moving very much because it's so large uh and it's very grounding because of that it's a landmark there's a reason why in civilization, when you, you know, plant your little city around a mountain, you know, you get bonuses for that, for the people that live there in your broader sip, you know, because it's that cool.
And it's no wonder that a variety of cultures throughout history have thought of mountains as like avatars of God or even worshipped them because holy shit. And there's a reason why, you know, you were likely enamored with riding a horse up these hills, spamming the jump button in order to skip a variety of bullshit in Skyrim. You know, it's kind of the same thing. There's a modern interpretation of ancient civilization respecting mountains in that way. I really like it. Um, like I say, it's grounding. It's really cool to see in the distance. It just makes me feel good. I love looking at it. And I've never like lived around a mountain like that. And I don't, I don't know how many people in the United States do. I wonder how long it would take to climb up there. How long to climb Mount Rainier? The duration of the climb depends on many variables, including snow conditions, the time of year, the route conditions, and the weather, but a typical summit push typically involves 10 to 12 hours of climbing round trip from Camp Mir... Muir? Miaur... From Camp Miaur... What is that? Like, fucking Neko Mimi shit? Cat boy, cat girl camp? What the hell's that? Anyway, this is some bullshit. I don't like it. <laughs>